And then I just wanted to share like kind of what shocked me after I opened my clinic, which after nine town hall meetings and getting 100 pages of testimony and reading it, like I was open one month later. Because what people want is so easy to deliver, they just want me. Like a human interaction, which you can pretty much do for free. You know what I mean? You don't need extra equipment, you don't need a big room, you don't need big overhead, you don't need special statues and fountains. You know, I mean, you can have that if you want, but basically they just want you. So the first person who's willing to be authentic and have fun and be a doctor wins, right? Because that's what the patients want. So do it, you know, it's so easy. And some of us who have PTSD might need a lot of therapy before we can find ourselves again, but it's totally worth it because like that's how we're gonna have healthcare in this country. Healthcare is not gonna be delivered from legislation and waiting for the next set of regulations to come from above. You know, like healthcare is gonna happen when we find our own souls again, since that's what's missing in healthcare. You know, find our, we have lots of technology, it's great, but we've lost our souls. So we just need to figure out who we are again and then be that person. And you've learned an amazing skill set from whatever medical school you attended, but that's just a skill set that you're bringing with you. That's not all of you. That's like, I don't know, 30% of what you're bringing. You're mostly bringing yourself because you are a natural born healer or you wouldn't have gone through all this education to try to do what you want to do if you didn't naturally feel called to heal people, which is something you were born with. So anyway, don't forget who you are. I tell medical students all the time because they forget who they are. I say, like, what did you write on your personal statement? They don't always remember. They sometimes try to dig it up for me. And then I say, well, how much are you paying for tuition? And they're paying, like, $50,000 a year. And so I'm telling them, wow, like, you're paying $200,000 to learn a skill set that will allow you to be the physician that you described on your personal statement for which you were accepted into the medical school. It's not like it was a big surprise and you secretly want to be something else, you totally disclosed what you wanted to be, right? Then you go to medical school and they beat that out of you. They tell you, you can't be the kind of doctor you want to be, at least that's what medical students tell me, is that like their dreams get crushed. Like within the first few months of medical school, what is the purpose of doing that? I don't know. Um, and then I just remind them, look, like you're paying this much money to, to learn a skill set so that you can be who you want to be. So don't get talked out of it. I don't know if any of you, probably you're in a much more supportive environment at your school, I hope. <laughs> um, but anyway, you will be happier if you become the person you always wanted to be and not somebody else and not a cookie cutter doctor on assembly line of medicine. And so the big shock to my system was, um, oh wow, I'm making more money this way than I made working for the man, you know? And so I'll just describe my actual salary to you in both uh, situations so you can kind of get what you can extrapolate for your situation. Which I think, I heard only 5% of you ever work as an employee for somebody else. You mostly go into self-employed solo practices, which is super smart, that's great. I hope you can help the allopathic doctors do that because we're really suffering, like not having any mentors who are as happy as they could be practicing medicine the way it used to be practiced before 1965. Um, so maybe you could shine a beacon of light onto the rest of us. You can save us. Okay. So, so I, I compare these two models. Like right now, I say I'm in a low overhead volume employment model, which I call love. Okay. The other option is the super high overhead employment model, which is shove. You know? <laughs> so you get a choice. Like you could love your job, and usually it's relationship driven medicine. That's the big difference, basically. You have a choice. In medicine, you have two big choices. That I, you could choose between relationship driven medicine or production driven medicine. And you totally know which one you're on by how you feel when you start your day. In production driven medicine, you get there and you're like, how many patients on your schedule? And you're like counting numbers and you're looking at your watch and so you are on a production line. Relationship driven medicine, you're like, oh wow, this is great, I'm gonna see Sue at nine. You know, and you feel really happy and you don't feel rushed and uh, that's because you're in a relationship driven love type practice, right? So I just think most healers wanna be on this side, you know? Maybe some people are happy in urgent care. You know, some people are happy doing fast paced medicine. And if they're happy, that's great. There's no right or wrong way. It's just I see so many people who like are living in victim mode, trapped in a shove model that doesn't work for them. 
So that's just not the only model. So basically, I was an employee that had partnership potential in 2000 to 2002. I uh, spent two years in the shove model before breaking free and doing my own thing. And I worked full time, you know, instead of, so the difference is like, this is love over there, right? So on this side, I was uh, self-employed versus being an employee. I was, um, I am part-time versus full-time. Over here, I work three half days a week, which is totally different than working four full days a week, which were really full days, like to the point of like exhaustion to your bones, full days, right? Because over here, I was seeing 28 patients a day and 112 patients a week versus now eight patients a half day and 25 patients a week. So I'm seeing the same number, of, I'm seeing less patients per week than I saw in a day. And people will be like, oh, you're such a slacker. That's what doctors like to make fun of each other because you didn't play the number game as well as I did. Well, you know, like, I don't know. I actually was able to cure so many of these people over here and help them transform their lives because actually I had time with them. So spinning and churning people around inefficiently and throwing drugs at them, 28 patients a day, doesn't make you the winner. You know, I just like to say that. It's not make you the winner. <laughs> it doesn't make me the slacker, okay? Because I'm actually, like, spending 36 minutes with each patient and solving their last 10 years worth of problems that they can never get answered on the assembly line. So this makes more sense to me. And plus, let's see, I have a patient panel of like four to 500 patients, like close to 500 now. And then over here, I had a patient panel of like 2,000. So I was able to uh, take care of 2,000 people really, really poorly, or take care of 500 people really, really well. So I don't know. It's much easier to be a good parent to two children than to 17. You know, you just have to figure out. Like, it doesn't, sometimes you might not remember their names. You could have so many kids that you have to put name tags on them and color code their toothbrushes because there's too many kids in your house. And that's probably how you feel on a shove model. And over here, you actually can do your job because you're working in a, at a humane pace. You know, we need to bring humanity back to healthcare. And the way to do that is to allow doctors to be human and work at a human pace. Even though we have gadgets that can do 16 things at once, like, People don't really want that. They want you to work at a human pace and to spend time with them and give them honest answers to their questions, which only you can do and a cyberspace robot can't, you know, really do spiritual healing and emotional connection. Like, we really do need people, like live people in healthcare. And so basically, like, I had overhead expense over here of like about $1,000 a month versus $30,000 a month over here. Like, my overhead was $370,000 a year. Like I brought in $500,000 a year revenue and 370,000 went to overhead, which is probably explains why I was exhausted and I didn't have time to have sex with my husband and we got a divorce. You know what I mean? If you're that exhausted, it doesn't work. Over here, a great boyfriend, you have all the time in the world. I, you know, $1,000 a month, like waking up at the beginning of the month and owing $30,000 on a credit card is way different than waking up with $1,000 on a credit card, you know? And so, at the end of the month, like bringing in, um, basically I could bring in like $140,000 a year based on the numbers I told you in my love practice, about 25 patients a week. And, um, and so with a $10,000 overhead basically per year, like I was making $130,000 is the potential income you can make working for yourself with really low overhead, which is basically, I was on $110,000 a year salary with a production bonus that was possible and I was supposed to get a $20,000 production bonus, but I had to already have done for two years in order to get it. And I liked these guys, but they were totally willing to keep my money. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know. Do you want to work for people who prey on you, that you have to beg for the money that you actually earned? It's so much easier when you work for yourself. Because you don't generally jip yourself out of the money you earned. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, um, that's the kind of shocking financial piece. Uh, so there are three calculations that you really should understand when you open any type of practice or if you become an employee. And one is you really need to know your percent overhead because like that affects the whole quality of your life. So my percent overhead over here was 74%. And it's like, it was basically about 7% over here, my first year. So basically what that means is that, um, like say I see somebody for whatever condition, I charge them $100. Like I'm getting paid $26 before taxes over here for like 
a 20 minute visit or whatever it was. And over here, I paid myself 30 minutes, make $100, and I leave the room with 93. Like it feels so much di different when you leave the room with $93 instead of 26 for the same amount of work. Um, I really recommend this side here. And then I figure, okay, so figure out, like, don't just be clueless. You know how many doctors I ask, like, what's your overhead? Like, they have no idea, especially if they're working for somebody else, they have no idea. Like, if one of the major employers in my town, the percent overhead is, like, 85% or more. Like, even worse than my favorite factory job, you know? Like, 90% even. Which, you look at these doctors who are working 15 hours a day and they look exhausted. Like, that's why they're exhausted, because they're, like, slaves, you know, and paper chains. They don't understand they could just slip out of it at any moment. So um, then you should figure out DMW, so percent overhead, and then DMW is days needed to work. Like you really need to understand how many days per year you work to pay your overhead. That gives you a lot of clarity. So basically, I had a contract over here that was for 194 days per year, which at 70, you multiply your days needed to work per year times your percent overhead. So times 74% meant that I worked 143 days per year for free, like just for fun, just to pay the mortgage on a building that I don't even own, you know, just give it all away. Like, okay, now I can take, um, I work about 150 half days a year times 7% is like, I don't know, 11 half days. I could pay my yearly overhead at 11 half days, which means I could go do medical mission work and not worry about leaving like huge debt and the clock ticking on my overhead while I'm gone. I could, like I went to help at Katrina and it was like, I didn't keep thinking, oh wow, I'm in the hole for leaving. And, and basically my patients were like, oh, you're a hero, yeah, go. Like people keep thinking like, oh, you can't abandon your patients, that's being a bad doctor. My patients were really happy, they thought I was cool to do that, you know what I mean? So um, you don't have to feel like you're in prison unless you put yourself in prison, but you should kind of know what you're signing up for. You should ask if you're gonna be employed somewhere, what's my overhead percent? I'm almost done and I'll take questions. Um, and then here's the shocking piece. Have you heard numbers needed to treat? You guys use that terminology, we use that in allopathic medicine all the time. Like, yeah, how many numbers of such and such patient, you know, how many numbers of patients do you need? Don't ask for them to save one person from a heart attack, you know, NNT, numbers needed to treat. Well, I just use it in an economic Numbers needed to treat to pay overhead. Take your days needed to work and you multiply it by the number of patients you see per day. And then you get the shocking number of how many patients you had to see per year, 4,004 to pay your yearly overhead. Versus now I could do it in 91. So I don't know, do you want to pay your overhead by seeing 4,004 patients or 91 patients? And by the way, like I answer at least like five questions for people when they come in for their visits. They want to know, is this mole okay? I sprained my ankle. You know, they have migraines, sex drive, my marriage is falling apart. Like they have lots of different primary care questions. So if you multiply the 4,004 patients by the five or more questions they're asking, that means I answered 20,000 medical questions for free, just for fun. And I absorbed all the liability for that and I just, gave my life force energy away for 20,000 questions. So, I don't know. To me, it's pretty clear, like, wouldn't most people want to join me over here? Um, I totally recommend it. There's all these different, okay, I take a question about that. I was, um, can you explain the math one more time about why are you multiplying your overhead by your days needed to work? That's okay, like, percent overhead is basically, um, like, your overhead divided by your total revenue. So that's the fraction, it's a fraction. So it would give you a percent. So like for me over here, it's 370,000, uh, like over 500,000, you know, and it gives you like a percent, 74%, okay? And so like, I just wanted to know, well, wow, how many days was that that I had to go to work for free? So I took 74%, which was my percent overhead, and I multiplied it by the number of days that I work in a year that was in my contract, which was 194 days. So 194 times 74% meant that I worked 143 full days, which was 8.6 months out of the year for free, like a total slave. 
Um, and clueless that I was doing that until I managed to extract myself and figure out these calculations because I knew there was a calculation for how fatigued doctors are. And this is the calculation that will determine uh, the quality of your marriage, whether you spend time with your children, whether you enjoy the wonderful mountains and skiing and the great school system, all the things they promise you when you sign on the contract, you know. Uh, if, you're, if you're already being taxed 74% on your money before you even pay federal and state tax, you're possibly going to feel like shit. Sorry to say. It's just a lot to pay. And then you take that and you multiply it by the number of patients you see per day to get NNT numbers needed to treat. And I think that gives you a lot of clarity about what you're doing in your practice. And whether you like how you're setting things up. And whether the extra square footage was really worth it. You know, was it really worth it to get three exam rooms when you would have a lower numbers needed to treat and days needed to work and percent overhead and more time off? You know what I mean? To have a smaller office? And did you do this math based on like a yearly salary that was getting built for you, or did you just? Do no, I did it based on the real numbers. Like, like I was uh, like being kind of a sleuth at my last employee job, and I always wanted to see the numbers, you know, and I kept track of all that because I somehow knew like this would make for a good book later. I'd want to know about this so I could compare the before and after because I just knew one day I would break free and I wanted to be able to have the real numbers, right? And then just multiplying kind of like the amount that I was earning per patient um, and the number of days I was working and just to see it's just it gives you great clarity. Okay. So any another question? cheat sheet on how to open an ideal clinic. But basically, you just, when you look at what people want, they want you. Like, nowhere in there do they say another receptionist, another phone line. You know what I mean? Like, the practice management journals that are suggesting that you do this are out of sync with what patients want. And it's totally different in tertiary care where you need a team and you're having a lung transplant and the health pad has to be there and you need a big, you know, we're talking about primary care, like pretty simple stuff for the most part. So, like, basically, you can do, for example, I don't do this, but you can do online scheduling with appointment quests for, like, $6 a month or something like that. Like, I just have people email me, and I have a whole system down where it only takes two emails per person. And so, since I have low volume, I kind of like, I'm like a control freak. I like doing my own schedule, you know. So, um, so I schedule online, so it doesn't really require any phone calls, except for the three older patients I have who don't have internet, who have to call every time, you know. And so I do that the old-fashioned way that most people just schedule online. And then they come for their appointment time right at their appointment time. So it's great because I'm ready right when their appointment starts. Or either I have a gift basket full of soap. And they come in and, like, while I'm talking to them, I'm doing their blood pressure and their pulse. And, you know, like, there's no reason for anyone else to be there. Like, in most clinics, a patient comes in and then, I don't know, there's bulletproof glass and they had to fight to get there. And they're, like, knocking on the glass and they open it up and the person on the other side doesn't look really that happy to see you. They're like, why are you here? And they have to say, because I had a cough. And then you have to sit for two hours coughing all over everyone in the waiting room. And then they finally take you back. And then you're still coughing. And the nurse comes in and says, why are you here? And you say, you have a cough. And they write it down. And then they leave. And then the doctor comes in. And they're like, well, why are you here? Because they haven't read that you have a cough. Even though you're coughing, then it should be obvious. But it's like, you know, like too many cooks in the kitchen. Who wants that? It doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Like, this is totally too complex for primary care. So anyway, if you remove all these people who are basically in your way, let's just face it, they were in my way. Like, I feel so much happier not having all these. This is like being married to somebody and, and going to sleep at night and your CPA is in the room with you and, the, and then you've got the insurance agent. It's like, what are these people doing there? Like, honestly, healthcare is a sacred relationship between two people that are going to have 
a physical, emotional, and spiritual like healing experience, okay? Which if you do it right, you feel invigorated after the visit as the doctor, and the patient leaves smiling and laughing, and it all went really well. And the more people you put in between, the less likely that you're gonna have time or even make an adequate income after you try to connect with somebody real quick in a five minute visit where they teach you don't put your hand on the door because that makes the patient feel like you're leaving. I mean, we should see the stuff they teach us. So this is the kind of practice management we get. In allopathic medical school, they teach us like sit down, even if it's for 30 seconds, it makes the patient feel like you were there longer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we have to learn all this total BS when really it's like, why don't they just leave us alone so we can be the healers we were born to be with the skill set that we learned in whatever medical school we attended that fits our personality and our, our you know, sense of wisdom. And anyway, so. That was okay. awesome. Cool. That was really great. I am so glad I taped that. I'm going to listen to that a hundred times. <laughs> awesome. Okay, yes. Put it all over the internet. It's great. Everyone should know this. Okay, here are some, uh, I promised in the little um, the little flyer that I saw in the bathroom stall, I promised what I was going to deliver today, uh, to learn cutting edge practice models. Okay, here are some practice models. There's Community designed ideal clinics, that's like what I did. I put the patient in charge. Okay, here are the two things. You're either on relationship driven healthcare or production driven healthcare. Then there's another thing you have to decide. Are you gonna deliver patient centric healthcare or physician centric healthcare? Like basically the allopathic model delivers physician centric healthcare in a production model. Totally a slap in the face for the patient. Then they call it the patient centered medical home. Total slap. Now, if you want to do a real patient-centered medical home, you ask the patient what they want. And none of them are asking for, give me all the narcotics in the world, and you know, like they're not asking for unreasonable things. They want like what makes them healthy, right? And so you have a patient-centric practice that's relationship-driven, and you will be super happy because you won't be having an invisible tug of war in the room, which is how most doctors feel. They're trying to shove you on an algorithm and that you're not even there for that. You're there to discuss your marriage or something. And they didn't get any, um, they didn't learn how to do marital counseling in medical school, so it's like a mismatch. You know what I mean? Like, what's gonna happen during that appointment? They're gonna offer you Prozac, but that's not even why you're there. You know what I mean? It just gets really muddy if you get out of balance with yourself and who you are, and the further you get over here on physician-centric production line, the less in touch you're gonna to be with your patient, the less healed you're gonna feel from the visit, and it's not gonna work out that well for your patient. So, um, so community design ideal clinics, that's I think the coolest model ever, you know, because my town did that first, and I love Eugene. And then there's also the ideal medical practice model, which is basically similar to what I'm doing, only like they didn't do the town hall meeting part, okay? But since patients and physicians mostly want the same thing, they're really striving for the same kind of things, but they tend to be a little more physician-centric because they didn't do the town hall parts. But some people are actually clueless about what people in their town want, so they never actually ask them. And they, oh, you don't have to have a town hall meeting, you just carry around your cell phone or some sort of audio recorder, and when you're in line or at the bus stop or at the airport, just start asking people near you, wow, I'm getting ready to graduate medical school, what would be like an ideal clinic for you? Or, how much do you want your doctor to treat you? Can you describe an ideal doctor? It's people that are bored out of their mind right now waiting for buses, planes, or laundry to be finished, waiting in line at grocery stores. Don't waste a single minute. Start interviewing people wherever you're standing, and you will get amazing information without even having to have an official town hall meeting, right? You just want to figure out what is the community zeitgeist, right? What is the spirit of the times? What do people feel right now in Portland, Oregon? What do they really want from a doctor? And who's asking this? You might be the only one, which is great. That's like, you're gonna win. You're gonna get all the patients because you'll be doing what they want. If you want that many patients, you might be overloaded. Within six months, I'd start a waiting list. My waiting list was longer than my patient panel really quickly. And then it became so onerous to manage a waiting list that was longer than the number of patients I actually were taking care of. I, I had to stop keeping a waiting list. You know, that's how much people want this type of medical model. Okay, then there's the direct pay model, which is basically the pre-1965 pre-Medicare model where people just did fee-for-service and they 
like common sense, like everything else, paid some reasonable amount for a reasonable service from a doctor they liked in their neighborhood, okay? That is coming back. Then there's concierge care, okay? Those are people who wanna charge maybe more top dollar, but roll out the red carpet for you. If you're one of those people that like, you just have to see who do you wanna serve? Maybe you wanna serve rich Catholic people. I don't know, go to your church, tell them you're ready to start a VIP Catholic clinic, or you know what I mean? And people will come to you who are wealthy. You know, you could do that. And you could fly with them to Bermuda and do acupuncture on them when they're on the beach. And you know, if that's the kind of clinic you want to do, maybe you're attracted to poor people. Okay, you could do this really cool benefactor model. The benefactor model is where you attract rich people, uh, and then you tell them, like this one guy in Modesto, California, it's called the Robin Hood model. He did, he went to his Catholic church. And he said he's going to open this clinic. Well, he wanted to serve migrant farm workers. The only way to serve migrant farm workers in allopathic medicine is to get on the production line at a community health center, federally funded community health center, where you're pushing them through really fast. But he wanted to do like more like relationship-driven care with migrant farm workers. But how are you going to do that? Well, he decided to opt out of insurance altogether and charge six hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a person for like an all-you-can-eat primary care buffet, and for that amount of money, they were adopting a migrant farm worker family. So it's super cool. You are not only paying for your own health care for the whole year, you know, depending on your age, if you're a healthy 30-year-old, maybe you're paying $600 a year, but that also would then pay for a, a relatively healthy 30-year-old migrant farm worker who would get free care on, like, total local charity that works. You know what I mean? Instead of sending money to a charity far away where 94% goes to administration, like, if you have a doctor that you trust, is actually doing this and I would take it a total step further and introduce them to the person that they're supporting and make it like where they spend Christmas together and they become best friends, you know? <laughs> That's just, I think like people need to break out of their social circle and meet people that are really different from them and have a mind expanding experience. And it's great because you're supporting somebody locally and then you're like the cool person that's doing all that because without you it would never happen. Okay, so then there's um, membership medicine. That's kind of like a gym membership. You know what I mean? You pay to join the club, and then you pay a monthly fee, and it's reasonable. And so it's kind of like concierge care for the masses, you know, like but reasonable. And then there's a house call practice, or what if you just did house call visits, like on elderly people or homebound people or people who are busy, or what if you did visits on people at work? You know what I mean? They they're workaholics and they want their acupuncture during their lunch break, laying on their desk. I don't know. There's probably different ways you could set your practice up where you go to them. Um, there's the low overhead model, which I think you should do no matter what, unless you're trying to do the VIP thing where you're, you know, have the biggest statue and the best fountain in town and everyone comes to you because they want to brag that they're in brand name <laughs> Dr. Bill, you know what I mean? But if you, uh, otherwise I think you should do low overhead just because you'll be economically free from the noose that would be otherwise around your neck. And then you could 